Up in the skies, Gao Peng has come across a swarm of divine tadpoles, or something like that. They're weird. To get a closer look at them, he uses the unification skill with Fishy and leaps into his body, much to the fish's frustration. When Gao Peng tells him to just shut up and go check out the tadpoles, he does so. In the distance, he spots several flying monsters, making a beeline for the tadpoles as well. Fishy just snarks at Gao Peng for not knowing what's going on, causing the man to huff in annoyance. Just then, some of the tadpoles lag behind the rest of the swarm and are instantly grabbed up by the hostile monsters. At Gao Peng's command, Fishy races for the swarm and grabs up one of the tadpoles before they can all be stolen away. To Fishy's confusion and Gao Peng's surprise, the tadpole only struggles for a fraction of a moment before falling asleep. Talk about having your priorities straight. Suddenly, Gao Peng notices something out of the corner of Fishy's eye and tells him to look at the sun. Once he does so, the pair witness the appearance of a giant golden palace of all things in front of it. They're both tempted to go near it in hopes of finding treasures, but are stopped in their tracks by what happens next. The palace changes and in its place is a giant golden toad. The moment opens its mouth, the swarm of tadpoles practically forces itself down his throat, eager to be eaten. Both trainer and familiar are blown away by the power of this new creature, Galpun more so, once he sees the stat window. This is a level 99 quasi-god sun golden toad, on the verge of evolving to divinity. Fishy tells Galpun they must escape, as it's using the law of sunfire to temper its body, confusing Galpun once more, since Fishy was once a god too. Fishy just angrily reminds him that he's not in his prime anymore, we could have squashed this thing. Right as he's explaining the threat before them, the Golden Toad's evolution comes to a head, and waves of orange energy emit outwards from it. The hostile monsters from before are turned to ash by the outpouring of energy alone right before their eyes. When they look back up at it, the Toad is now a level 100 Paramount God. What's more, another entity has appeared, bathed in blue light and obscured in a terrifying, cloudy coat. As Fishy attempts to flee out of fear, the blue being's energy shoots out like a shockwave at everything in the area. After frying the golden toad, said shockwave crashes into Fishy, in turn making him crash into the ground. Moments later, Gao Peng separates from Fishy and stands on his own feet. While asking what's happening up there, Fishy explains that the toad is considered his sun deity and is thus the mortal enemy of moon deities, one of which has shown up to fight. The two of them just happen to get caught in a crossfire, so just pure dumb bad luck then. That checks out. Fishy goes on to explain some of the intricacies of pantheons, and how they're just groups of gods that aren't strong enough to go solo, like the true gods. Yao Peng proceeds to hurt Fishy's feelings, by mentioning how he's weak enough to fear even them now, and instantly regrets it. He quickly calms him down and switches the topic, asking about the ocean pantheon. Fishy explains there's no such thing, since the ocean gods refuse to obey any one of them as a leader. Though he's disappointed, Yao Peng already has something else in mind. He faces Fishy with a glint in his eyes, and asks him to introduce the man to his ocean god. Fishy tries to play dumb about who that is, but Gao Peng is quick to remind him they already spoke of this being. That's right, it's time to meet Fishy's son. Without a single heartbeat's worth of hesitation, Fishy shoots that idea down and tells Gao Peng that he's not on good terms with his kid. Gao Peng insists that no matter what, it's his child, so it's not like he's going to eat Fishy or anything. Besides, they need a quasi-god on their side, for what's coming. Fishy scrunches his face to think for a few moments before finally giving in. He tells Gao Peng that he'll take him there, but can't guarantee any actual success. He only moderately regrets this a second later, when Gao Peng starts petting him furiously with gratitude. Sometime later, the pair are in a small base city, under the Ural Mountains. Seeing the ruined condition of the place prompts Gao Peng to ask Fishy if he's sure this is the spot. The familiar confirms that it is, since the new rift in the North Bear Country here passes through its own dimensional sea. I didn't get any of that, so we'll chalk it up to spirit mumbo jumbo. Gao Peng spots a newspaper with warnings of an impending devil. He grabs the thing and starts reading. In it, he finds a story about terrible demons that will soon attack the Earth, far worse than even the monsters from spatial rifts. That, and the government's efforts to relocate all humans to a safer world for the time being. Ah, it's just propaganda for a good cause for once but still. Gao Peng spots an old man cruising by and realizes that some still haven't been able to evacuate, something he fears will put them in a worse situation, if they can't repel the ancient tribes. When he turns to Fishy, he's surprised to find sympathy in the little being's eyes. 
something he attributes to also being forced out of his home by the fight between two greater beings when he was much younger. This further convinces him to help Gao Peng recruit his child, and tells him he'll try to put in a few words, but that's all. Excited by Fishy's sudden altruism, Gao Peng calls out his dragon baby mount and takes off. He doesn't get far though, as further in the city he hears a call for help. When he turns towards it, Gao Peng sees a man cradling a baby and asks what's wrong. The man and his wife both beg Gao Peng to take their baby with him, so it can be safe. When he sees how desperate they are, Gao Peng is launched into a flashback of his own childhood, when his parents hid him away and faced their doom alone, so he could live on. Spurred on by the memory of parental love and his own good nature, Gao Peng puts out his arm and tells them he'll do it. The parents are equally as relieved, as they are sad to be separated from their child. Gao Peng takes one look at the adorable baby, and knows he's made the right choice. He calls out silly, and has the spatial manipulator drop a large crate before the parents. Before taking back off, Gao Peng calls out to the parents that they shouldn't give up on their family. One day, their child will come back to them. After he wishes them good luck and flies off with a wish to see them again, the father opens the crate. He's stunned to see several days' worth of supplies, easily enough to get them through their current predicament. Up in the open skies, Gao Peng holds the baby close as Fishy asks what they'll do, since they can't take the baby where they're going right now. Gao Peng just pulls out his phone and tells Fishy that he'll find a way. Or to hold that thing more carefully, dude. Later, the group is on the edge of a sea area on Earth. Here, an old face arrives to greet Gao Peng at his request. It's sister Tang Tang. During their quick reunion and exchange of pleasantries, Gao Peng learns that she's staying on Earth to help with the last bits of cleanup. As soon as she finishes, though, she plans to head back to the Black Fog world, since her familiar is about to evolve. Just then, she finally notices the baby in Fishy's fins. As she stares between the baby, the fish, and Gao Peng, the cogs in her head turn. And she comes to the most logical conclusion. Gao Peng and his fish have had a baby. Yup, totally logical. Sensible even. For sure. A few moments pass with no reaction from anyone to Tong Tong's insane statement. Then, like a landmine that just had its pressure sensor set off, Gao Peng explodes with disgust and incredulity. How the hell does she think that would even be possible? It's a damn fish, thankfully. Tong Tong has enough between her ears to realize that he's right and looks sheepish over the conclusion. Gao Peng explains how the baby was entrusted to him by a couple in Northern Bear Country. He also tells her that he wants to ask her to take it to the Black Fa world for now, since he has something else to do. Further than that, he also tells her about a team he's assembled to help people still stuck on Earth for whatever reason. He wants to leave that to her and Grandpa G to handle stuff on a case-by-case -case basis. Tong Tong can only smile at how much the little boy she looked out for has grown up. Gao Peng smiles back at her and tells her that now it's his turn to protect all those he loves. Once Tong Tong is on her way with baby Alexi, Gao Peng turns to Fishy and tells him to lead the way to his kid. Fishy displays his unwillingness yet again and requests that they just head back to the Black Fog world, but Gao Peng is having none of that after how far they've come. When Gao Peng asks where this is coming from, Fishy explains that he had a massive falling out with his child's mother and even kicked the kid out of their pantheon. Gao Peng is understandably frustrated by this and asks what kind of father would do that to their son. Rather than addressing the question, Fishy decides to be a petulant little douche and says that it's actually his daughter, not his son. Holy crap, he just turned into an um actually guy. As expected, this does nothing to appease Gao Peng, who slaps the snot out of Fishy and asks if that makes him proud. Surprisingly enough, Fishy actually looks a little remorseful then, and explains that the situation at the time was extremely complicated. He's afraid his daughter won't forgive him and asks, if they can just go back home and focus on strengthening himself instead. Once more, Gao Peng's only stirring emotion is frustration. He tells Fishy in no uncertain terms that if they wait for him to regain his power, Earth's people even in the Black Fog world will be taken by the tribes as cannon fodder. If he must, He'll die before Fishy's daughter, right here and now. Unable to talk his way out of this, Fishy makes his way to the abyss of the sea and looks around for something. Gao Peng speaks up inside his mind, from where he's using the unification skill to join their bodies. Fishy takes a deep breath and steals himself, before dashing for the location where he can sense his daughter. Once he's there, his tail is suddenly caught in a glowing blue web, which causes him to turn with shock and horror. Behind him, a giant spider appears and asks what little bug is here to disturb it. It then emerges from the shadows. 
acknowledging Fishy as its father and holding him at blade point. The beast furiously roars out to ask what he's doing here and if he's come to die in this pathetic, weakened state. Fishy is internally screaming at Gao Peng for putting them in this situation when the man takes the reins and tells Fishy to let him do the talking. Outside, Fishy remorsefully addresses his daughter and apologizes for his past actions. He gives a short speech on how much he regrets what he did and how much he loves her. As planned, Fishy's daughter actually pauses at what she's hearing and asks him when he learned to lie so well. In their mental space, Fishy just smirks and comments that she's pretty smart. The dude has zero faith in his own parenting too, I see. Gao Peng just tells him to shut up and continues begging for his daughter's forgiveness. Fishy's daughter is completely blown away by her father actually uttering such words and asks if he's being impersonated. Once more, Fishy comments that he is indeed being impersonated, annoying Gao Peng in her mental space. Outside though, his daughter seems to have fallen for the whole play hook, line, and sinker as she shrinks down from her giant monster form to a holy crap. Man, what the hell is it with monster chicks always being so hot? In this new form, she smiles at her father and comments that she doesn't dislike this side of him. Inside their mental space, Fishy is overjoyed and comments on how simple his daughter must be to get fooled by a bunch of words from a vile being like Gao Peng. Jeez, somebody give him the worst father of the year award. Despite her dropping her hostility, Fishy's daughter still isn't entirely willing to make nice with him and tells him to leave while she's in a good mood. Gao Peng, still speaking through Fishy's mouth, goes ahead and puts up a super convincing display of apologetic groveling. He tells her he was too proud to admit his mistakes and now he'll die at the hands of other monsters if he doesn't get her help. Fishy's daughter is quiet for a moment before spinning around to face him and says that he's got a problem. Gee, yeah, I think. Gao Peng tells her that in his current weakened form, He'd rather be eaten by her than some random upstart monsters if he has to be. Inside the mental space, Fishy is freaking out and grabbing a Gao Peng for putting his body on the line so casually. Gao Peng just tells him to shut up and stop interrupting. The daughter's hand shoots out and grabs the webbing Fishy is stuck in to hold him up to her face. She repeats his words about being eaten by her with downcast eyes and then drops him before turning back around. All she says next is that she wants to see who dares to steal food from her. Back in the mental space, Fishy is absolutely dumbfounded as to why she just left and didn't eat his body after all. Dude needs serious emotional counseling. Gao Peng tells him not to worry. Right as Fishy's daughter turns her head his way with a small blush, she tells him to stay here while she tidies up her place and makes sure her food doesn't escape while she's gone with him. This is what Gao Peng was aiming for. It was clear from the moment she didn't outright kill him that Fishy's daughter still cares about him to some extent. It's just the time apart and Fishy's mistakes that have strained that love. Gao Peng looks at Fishy with annoyance and jabs at him for wanting to protect his pride and refusing to apologize despite being at fault. Fishy just huffs in annoyance and claims that he has some dignity to maintain as a father. Yeah, lots of dignity there for sure, freaking scumbag. Gao Peng decides to just drop it, since this is who he is. More importantly, he finally has a quasi-god alley. Over in the Black Fog world, some members of the ancient tribes have arrived at the desolate labyrinth, where Southern Sky's main HQ is located. The representative of the tribe demands to speak to the ones he spoke to previously, and angrily bellows at them for trying to delay the signing of their contract. Behind the man, his son harumphs at the situation and speaks as though his father is doing them all the world's biggest favor by even being here, to negotiate with them rather than letting them die out. Just then, a representative of Southern Sky finally reaches the standoff and rushes up to the man to speak to him. This is Zhu Yuming, Southern Sky's joint business director. He tries to explain that they can't sign any contracts, with both Master Ji and Master Gao away on important business to save their people. The tribesman doesn't give a hoot though and says that that's not his problem. He just wants the contract signed and now. He tosses the contract to Zhu Yuming and says that if it isn't signed by today, his hand will be forced in this matter. To emphasize this point, he shoots a beam of golden light into the sky and calls forth his familiar, a giant golden-maned bear. With a single flap of its jaw, the bear shoots out a massive beam of energy that cracks open the labyrinth's protective shield, showing that it's well into the sink tier. The tribesman tells Zhu Yuming that he'll apologize for this and offer compensation if he signs their contract. Otherwise, this is only a taste of what will follow. Unable to delay any further, Zhu Yuming frustratedly prepares to sign the damn thing. 
wishing the whole time that director Ji or Gao Peng was here. Almost as if the man's prayer was heard by the heavens themselves, an oppressive energy suddenly appears in the sky above them, crushing the spirits of the ancient tribe. One of the men in the area spots something in the sky, and yells for everyone else to look. There's a wave of water in the air. Riding atop this wave is Fishy and his daughter, making their entrance in style. Down below, the tribesman Rep is stunned at the feeling of a quasi-god's pressure. Fishy, or rather, Gao Peng, tells his daughter not to be too harsh, and just hurt them a little. He answers her confusion at this with an explanation, about how there's a group of quasi-gods backing those tribesmen that might come after her in turn. With an understanding achieved, father and daughter don identical eel smirks, as she gathers an energy bolt in her hand. With only a promise to leave the bear alive, she lets the attack loose as it thunders down from the sky, and rips clean through the bear's shoulder. Blood erupts from the hole in the beast's shoulder as it collapses to the ground, its master coming, running in concern. Despite the injury though, the sun bear holds its ground and glares up at Myrna. Fishy's daughter is just a mouthful, she's Myrna now. Myrna is only amused by the bear's defiance, showing not even a hint of concern. Before it can fire any sort of counterattack, she dives down from above and kicks the bear, so hard it punctures his body. In the ensuing chaos and debris, Gao Peng orders Fishy to find a particularly smoky area, so they can finally separate. As soon as this is done, Gao Peng feels relief to be back in his own body. Myrna actually spots them together, but Fishy quickly explains that he signed a contract with this human for a cooperative relationship. Though she doesn't question it, Myrna is rather perturbed by how much her old man has changed. As the dust finally clears, the bear is revealed to still be conscious despite all his injuries. Got handed to him. He's one tough sucker. Unfortunately for him, Myrna isn't having any of that. With a quick swipe of her claws, she sends forth a flurry of energy slashes as a warning shot to ensure it doesn't make any further moves. Sure enough, this works, as the bear is completely cowed and backs off. To the side, the bear's trainer silently observes Gao Peng and decides the best course of action here and now is simply to smooth things over with this man. He totally has no clue who he's about to talk to, does he? He addresses Gao Peng and tells him there's been some misunderstanding. Since those in the tribal alliance are friendly to each other and share and exchange their materials, Gao Peng just smirks at the man's ignorance and tells him that if his Chinese people need to resist foreigners, they'll handle it themselves, not with this farce of a contract of his. This only shocks the man, as he can't believe such a powerful trainer is from China, an earth country. In his mind, he's frantically trying to work out how the hell China has a quasi-god level in Voi, when Earth has only had the whole monsters and rifts thing for a handful of years. Ignorant, or more likely just uncaring, of the man's inner turmoil, Gao Peng saunders up to him and tells him to return to the elders with a message that the Chinese are peace-loving people. In the history of their world, the Chinese have known no such thing as war. Well, hold on now. I'm no historian, but something smells like bull here. Behind him, all of Gao Peng's comrades stand united in joy over his return and handling of the tribesmen. Lady Xu even has Grandpa Ji on a video call and tells him he doesn't need to come after all since Gao Peng handled it. Wherever he is, Grandpa Ji speaks to her while riding his dragon. He's sure Gao Peng must have gone through a lot to recruit a quasi-god in such little time and ponders on how freakishly high his growth rate is. This confirms for him that he can leave things in Gao Peng's hands while he focuses on helping with the formation of the rescue teams on Earth. Not that he didn't already trust the young man, of course. Meanwhile, one particular guy is still stunned by Gao Peng's claim about China's history being bloodless. Thank you, glad someone else is on that too. Back to the matter at hand, the opposing tribesman declares that he is that Gao Peng fellow. Man, this guy is slow. Gao Peng casually tells him to relax and puts forth the solid argument that his people are too weak to affect the coming battles and will only be a burden to the tribesmen. Backed into a corner, the other man can't exactly admit that he only wanted to contract them as soldiers to be used as cannon fodder. As such, he decides to hide behind his masters and announces that this matter must be decided by the quasi-god envoys of the Elder Council. Gao Peng stares at the man with a grin and tells him he's aware of their quasi-gods as well as the fact there are several. At a nudge from him, Fishy quietly signals Myrna to make a move. She gets the gist of it pretty easily and proceeds to fire an attack that injures the sun bear even further. As the tribesman panics over his familiar's condition, Gao Peng tells him that in China, an uninvited guest is required to leave a little greeting gift. Odd thing to tell him but alright. Then, 
he asked the tribesmen if, regardless of China's current weakness, he really wants another quasi-god enemy at the critical point of their war. In an unknown location, out in the wilderness of the squared world, a spatial rift suddenly tears open in the sky and spits out the sun bear and its master along with their men. Then, as they're regrouping, he notes the sun bear licking its wounds and reminds himself that St. Tyr monsters like itself have advanced healing so he'll be fine. If anything, it's lucky to still be alive after facing a quasi-god. The man's son is quick to worry though, as he points out the tribe will blame him for not completing their mission. The older man simply tells his son to go back and train his familiar hard and well for the coming war. When the fighting begins, reputation won't be worth a damn anyways. His son accepts this, and is about to move out when his father says one last thing. From what he can work out, a quasi-god tear that just thrashed them probably isn't Gao Peng's familiar at all. Seeing his son's confusion, the man tells him not to mention that to anyone, and just tell people the quasi-god was indeed his familiar. Regardless of whether or not they believe it, chances are they'll be tempted to confirm this for themselves. And when they do, they too will be humiliated as thoroughly as he has been today, leaving him no longer as the sole laughing stock. That's a whole new level of pettiness. Dude's a total troll. Over the headquarters of the tribe alliance, the tribe elders are holding a meeting over the latest developments. The green god tribe's elder is shocked to hear the mission failed, while the white dragon tribe chief is secretly amused. This is just what he expected after all. Some of the other elders demand to know how this is possible, since the man they sent, He Kuang, is an overlord tier trainer. A man from He Kuang's tribe takes that moment to speak up and says that rumors claim there's a quasi-god tier trainer in China. Naturally, this causes chaos in the meeting room, as people try to digest this new piece of information. As usual, the first question is how this is possible, when Earth has only had the monster system back for about a decade. Based on their latest info, Gao Peng is the only trainer there who's even at the Overlord tier. Oh man, that info's really outdated. The Green God Tribe's Elder goes on to speak about how a quasi-god trainer is a sign of more than just what it looks like. To have such a familiar means one must hold the potential to establish a top tribe with their knowledge of familiars. If this is all true, the Chinese tribe may well become one of the top tribes before long. From his seat, the leader of the Black Something Something clan, Mo Fo, finally pitches in, asking if such a prodigious talent could be a sign of the reincarnation of a god. The White Dragon Chief is quick to shoot down that idea, and assures them Gao Peng is no god, just a formidable young man who has connections to his own tribe. The Green God Tribe Elder wonders if that would mean the quasi-god he summoned was an ally, rather than a contracted familiar. Gramps really hit the nail on the head there. Nice. Mofo suddenly rises from his seat and declares that there's no time to waste. He will meet Gao Peng tomorrow in person. Then, if he kills the beast Gao Peng summoned, he will spare the life of the boy himself, out of consideration for the White Dragon Tribe. More importantly, the Chinese will then sign their contract obediently. Keep telling yourself that, pal. From his seat, the White Dragon Chief can only scoff at that whole plan with amusement. The Green Jeezer asks what he'll do if his own familiar is killed instead, but Mofo is confident his Buddha cannot be beaten. Now that's just fighting words. Over in the mountains, near the desolate labyrinth in the Black Fa world, we see a familiar face after quite some time in Stripey. Gao Peng is in his garden poring over the plans for the latest upgrade to the central city. There will be several layers of walls, with a King Tier trainer guarding each, and alarms for the police force with them all. This emergency plan that's been cooked up for their newly designed central city is City of Hope is one he's quite pleased by. As he's stretching, Gao Peng suddenly feels unusually bright sunlight from above. It only takes him half a moment to figure out this strange light is not in fact the sun. Over in the city, people all over the streets are looking up as well, and spot none other than the thousand-armed faceless Buddha of Mofo. As they watch on, Mofo steps forward in front of the Buddha and declares that he's here to invite the local quasi-god trainer to fight with him. While the citizens down below are annoyed at best, by this development, just wanting to live their lives in peace, Gao Peng is more amused. If anything, this took longer than he expected it to. Before Mofo even has time to register what's happening, his challenge is answered, the surprise attack, or rather, a surprise cage. Myrna has discreetly trapped him and his Buddha inside a massive lattice of spider webs. The second he spots her, the man starts spouting off about how this must be the quasi-god and blah blah blah. 
Myrna amusedly scoffs at the rambling, while Gao Peng comments that the bad guys sure do love talking a lot. You can say that again, man. Without so much as a moment's respite, Mofo senses Myrna dashing through the air and spider webs to come to attack his Buddha. He orders the massive avatar to avoid the attack, but soon finds that the webs all around them are limiting its movements far too much. With its ability to dodge hindered so heavily, the Buddha tries to fight back instead, shooting several of its arms forward at Myrna. This attempt proves to be pointless though, as Myrna just shields herself with ease and continues on her warpath towards them. Mofo is startled by the lack of effect from his move, but orders his Buddha to keep dodging as best he can. Turns out that doesn't work very well though, as he registers a second later, the Buddha's arm is trapped in yet another spider web line. Trapped and too slow to react in time, the Buddha ends up taking a blow right to the face from Myrna, leaving its face with a sizable crack. Mofo finally accepts that this quasi-god they're facing is too good to take lightly, and he fuses with the Buddha so they can fight more freely. As soon as the master and familiar unite, the Buddha unleashes its technique, Buddha Annihilation. Very creative. In a few seconds, the entire web lattice trapping the Buddha inside is torn to shreds and Mofo screams out to ask what Myrna can do now. Down below, Gao Peng is now a little concerned, as he didn't expect the Buddha to have such high explosive power. Next to him, Fishy is totally unbothered though, and comments that he'll see his daughter's serious fighting style soon. Up in the sky, Myrna emerges from the smoke of that last attack, now without her robe. As she stands in place, she silently rages over her web being destroyed, after spending all of last night spinning it. From his side of the battlefield, Mofo can sense the Quasigod's aura getting more and more dangerous by the second. It's preparing its killer move. Sure enough, Myrna proceeds to coat herself in her energy and blitzes through the Buddha's defenses, tearing them down little by little. Mofo is more than a little concerned now, as she's become even faster than before and has the Buddha on the defensive. Little by little, she whittles away at the Buddha's defenses, before finally taking on her full monster form. In this form, she shoots through the air at incredible speeds and crashes into the Buddha with enough power to crack open his body. Mofo shouts from his spot that he didn't expect this quasi-god to be so powerful. He declares that there's no sense in wasting combat power here, when the war is so close and orders the Buddha to flee. Dude got his crap rocks so hard he just split. Down below, Gao Peng praises the speed of Myrna and backhandedly insults Fishy by saying, She definitely didn't get that from him. Though he's angry. Fishy doesn't hesitate to admit, that her mother is definitely the faster one between the two of them, so he's not wrong. Gao Peng is just annoyed by Fishy's behavior. A few days ago, he wanted nothing to do with his former family, but now that he has a chance to feed his own ego, he's beyond eager to talk them up. That aside, Gao Peng is happy to have his theory confirmed. Despite its strength, the thousand armed faceless Buddha's attributes fall considerably short of their windstorm water magic spiders. Gao Peng studies her status window with pride, noting that she's a high-level violent assassin of sorts. The stat window in question displays her level 97 quasi-god tier, as well as her several overpowered skills. Right now, she's utilizing the one called Invisible Net to replace the trap Mofo and his Buddha triggered earlier. Staring up at her, Gao Peng finds himself in a state of utter confusion. Why is she bothering to weave the web again when their opponent has already escaped? Fishy puts on a smug face, as he so often does, and tells Gao Peng that he wouldn't understand the actions of a true quasi-god like his daughter. To her, the fight is never truly over. He starts flying up towards Myrna and praises her work, but then starts trying to tell her how to use her water element better. Because he's totally earned the right to act like a dad, not like he banished her from home for centuries or anything. Naturally, Myrna is more than a little frustrated by his words, and abandons the web she's weaving to leave the area. Her parting words are simply, that this old man is really annoying. With that, Fishy is left to limb and his daughter, entering what humans refer to as the rebellious phase. Gao Peng doesn't miss the opportunity to take a jab at him either. All that aside though, Gao Peng is confused as to why he still feels so hot if the faceless Buddha has already left. Turns out that's from Stripey blushing up a storm, since he's developed a crush on Myrna. Can't even blame him. Big fella's got good taste. Back on Earth, the allied tribes are at the top of Kumlin Mountain, with the White Dragon tribe's chief in the lead. Upon sensing his men shivering from both the cold and their own fear, he calls back to them not to be nervous. Everything will go according to their plan. Yikes. Famous last words, Gramps. Just then, a massive rift opens up in the sky above them. The chief calls out to his men that the clam god has awakened 
and to ready themselves for battle. Right as he finishes calling this out, an ominous-looking purple eyeball, coated in red energy, emerges from the rift. In another moment, it spreads a feeling of despair as insanely powerful monsters from across dimensions are shown to them somehow. Bai Yin is in the middle of asking his father something, when the chief cuts him off and says this is because of the seal on Earth lifting further. Suddenly, he senses something troubling up ahead. The spatial rift a little ways up from them is significantly larger than what they were expecting. There's no way they can carry out their intended mission in a rift this large. With that in mind, the chief orders his white dragon to take their men and get the hell out of there. Once that's done and their people have been secured, Bai Yin asks his father what their next move is, since their preparations have been wasted. The chief tells him this isn't necessarily true, since they have arrangements in other places on Earth too. Suddenly, one of the tribesmen calls out to look at something in the distance. To everyone's surprise, the thing he's pointing towards is the storm that was expelled from the spatial rift, and it's getting smaller. Then, as it all but vanishes, what appears to be a gargantuan severed finger is shot out of the rift and floats in place ahead of it. The chief orders his eldest son, Bai Mong, to have his men go take a look at this strange development. Bai Mong does just that and rides his own white dragon right underneath the severed finger. As soon as he gets there, some strange pores on the finger's cut surface burst and spew orange liquid. Then, from the open surface, fumes are sent out to infect the familiars nearby. As soon as one of the tribesmen's dragons breathes in these fumes, it starts going berserk. Its eyes go red. Veins start popping all over the place, and giant red growths appear all over its body. As the young man panics over losing control of his familiar, the dragon turns its gaze on him. Then, much to all their shock, it clamps its jaws down on its own rider. It's only at the last moment that the berserk dragon is subdued by a water-type familiar, and the young man is saved by Bai Mom. The chief's eldest son quickly calls out to the rest of his men to warn them about the fumes and their effects. Unfortunately, it seems it's already too late. Several more of their men start losing control of their familiars and freak out. The chief has seen enough at this point and steps in. His own white dragon saves the flailing tribesmen while knocking down the turned familiars. Right as they solve one problem though, another appears. A spatial rift full of plant life reveals itself right in front of the chief, confusing him with its appearance. Seconds later, the trees within reveal their true nature as evil-looking eyes open along their bark. The same eye that first exited the rift when they got here. As the tribesmen of the White Dragon tribe watch on, the rift widens and dozens, if not hundreds, of those sinister-looking trees leap onto Earth, raining down from the sky like a hailstorm of evil personified. As he watches on, the White Dragon tribe chief can only come to one conclusion. The war has begun. A few days later, some men can be seen observing a crater somewhere in the wilderness of Earth. This is the leader of the Poison Marsh tribe, Ziyuan, and his tribesmen. When Ziyuan asks about the situation in the Kunlun Mountains, one of his men reports that they've been unable to find the severed finger that was mentioned by the White Dragon tribe. Strangely enough, there are tons of needle sunflower trees along the way though. As he takes this in, Ziyuan wonders if the White Dragon tribe has lied to him and secretly taken away the severed finger. He's quick to dismiss that suspicion though, as he knows Bai Long, the white tribe leader, wouldn't do something so antagonistic right at the start of the war. How about that? An old dude with some actual sense. Even so, the tribe's relation to Gao Peng, who is rumored to be a descendant of their tribe's earth branch, gives him pause. After thinking things over for a bit, Zi Yuan decides to forget about it. Right now, he tells his men to focus on their mission to clear out low-tier monsters and collect more corpses. While the rest of the men get to work, Zi Yuan asks a young tribesman named Zi Hai if he sensed the aura of an overlord or saint in the area. Hai tells him there are some energy strands lingering here, but they're blurry at best, with one of them moving towards the mountains. Suddenly, he startles and informs Yuan that the energy signature on the other side of the mountains is moving towards them, and fast. Zi Yuan sees the ground below them shifting, and states that this fluctuation is of the Overlord tier. Silently, he pulls a tiny snake out of his robes and tells it it's time to go. The snake leaps at the ground and burrows its way inside the earth itself. There, it finds one of the roots that are stirring up the ground above. The snake instantly unhinges its jaw and bites into this root, injecting its venom deep into the organic matter. That's what she said. Up above, Zihai is stunned to see the roots, or rather vines, freeze in the air out of nowhere. A moment later, 
the lot of them shatter into dozens of pieces and collapse onto the ground. Completely neutralized, Ziyuan's snake hops back into his hand at the same moment, earning praise from the tribe leader. Over in the distance, another fluctuation occurs, this time much more potent and visible. This time it's a Saint Tier monster with the wood element again, meaning his snake is in luck. As Yuan tosses the creature in the direction of the fluctuation, the snake suddenly scalls up into a much larger and more intimidating creature. So creature leaps into the green light, that is the source of this latest fluctuation. The mountains themselves quake and tremble, from the aftermath of whatever battle is taking place there, causing Zihai to fear for his life. As he senses the level of danger he's been put in, without a second thought, he can only wish he hadn't been born, the illegitimate son of a dead father. Thanks to that, Zi Yuan barely even views him as his actual grandson, and has little regard for him. In his panic retreat from the site of the battle, one particularly strong tremor, knocks high onto the ground and forward a little. Here, he raises his head to see something strange. It's a single severed finger, wagging around in the mud in front of him. What happens next, is even more terrifying for the young man. The finger seems to have a mind of its own, and launches itself in his head, before sinking into the flesh. Zihai is freaking out about the finger entering his body. Pause. When Yuan shows up and tells him they're done here. Still freaked out, Zihai tries to tell his grandfather what just happened, but makes a yet even more terrifying discovery. He cannot speak. At least, not about anything regarding the finger. When next he opens his mouth, it's to tell Zi Yuan that he understands, and will be heading back now. As he treks towards the rest of the tribesmen, Zi Hai realizes that he cannot tell anyone about this incident. Later on, we see the residents of Zi Hai inside the temporary settlement of the Poison Marsh tribe in the Squared World. Here, the young man can be observed letting out deranged laughter while staring at his hand. That, and the fully purple, almost corrupted looking familiar standing in front of him. Internally, Zihai is positively giddy to see that it has worked. His middle finger has superpowers now. Huh, could have sworn I've had that dream before too. Though he has no clue how this happened, or what the finger that entered him was, he does know that his middle finger can now infect and strengthen monsters. Not only that, but the effect can even spread from monster to monster, without needing his input at all. Right at that moment, some tribesmen show up at High's place, and tell him that the team returning to Earth to deal with the tree demons is about to leave. A team he's meant to be on. Zihai quickly weighs the pros and cons of going on this mission. Back on Earth, he can test his new power out on the monsters there. At the prospect of gaining more of this power, his expression twists into a manic grin, with the flames of insanity behind his eyes. Meanwhile, Dumbi has returned to Gao Peng in the Black Fog world with an offering. As he stares at the undead ruler with a strange look, Gao Peng asks him if he knows the meaning of the word random, because that's what he requested him to catch out of the tree demons on Earth, so he can study it. Instead, he went out of his way to catch a Saint Tear demon tree for him. Dumbi bashfully admits that when Gao Peng said random, he just decided to get him the best possible option. Rather than realizing that he has over-delivered, Dumbi apologizes for having a limited ability and promises to catch an even more advanced one. Once he reaches the quasi-god tier, dude's the biggest glazer I've ever seen. Gao Peng ends up laughing it off and fondly comments on how only Dumbi would be so literal in his desire to please Gao Peng. During this, he notices Dumbi's stat window, and asks the undead monster just how fierce the fighting on Earth is right now, for his level to have risen again. Dumbi tells him there are just a lot of corpses, and just as many souls to be devoured there right now. Gao Peng thinks about how, ever since breaking through to Saint Tier, Dumbi's level has been very slow to rise, and yet, with just this latest mission to Earth, he shot up straight to level 83. Luckily, he doesn't really need to worry, since Mermet and Fishy are both back on Earth as well. With Earth having become little more than one massive corpse-riddled battlefield, Gao Peng decides to use it as an opportunity for Dumbi to become stronger. And so, he tells the big guy to let him inform the White Dragon tribe, and then head to Earth to support all his tribal friends. After all, while he can't consider letting China form an alliance with the tribes, focused on its own development as it is, he can always offer his own personal assistance, Behind him, Dummy praises his master for being so true to justice, because that's totally his main reason for doing this. Yep. Putting all that aside for now, Gao Peng studies the demon tree Dumbi has brought him, and finds that it's ordinary quality despite its level. That explains how Dumbi could take it down so easily, despite their similar levels. Between the sheer gap in her quality, Dumbi's resistance to its corrosive field, and his own breath of death being stronger, the tree never stood a chance. 
Hell the way that it is, he has doubts that even Da Z might be able to beat it, despite being a whole tier lower. Regardless though, he's sure that the same monster will yield great value. Through the ever handy refinement altar in his possession. At his command, the altar imp now known as Hei Wa pops into the world, and tells Gao Peng this is a great chance to improve his plant type familiar through a certain procedure. Seeing his confusion, Hei Wa clarifies that he's not talking about the formless hell tree, but good old flowery. Once Hei Wa is done whispering, a whole bunch of info straight into Gao Peng's ear. The young man summons Flowery and prepares to have him evolve. With a dash of motivation from Fishy, Flowery begins to absorb the essence of the demon tree. Gao Peng thinks about how Hei Wa mentioned a not insignificant chance of this method failing, but that's just how these things go. Without some risk, that wouldn't be such a thing as legends and myths. While that continues on in the background, Gao Peng receives a video call from Lady Xu, who tells him the White Dragon tribe has agreed to accept his help, in a private capacity. This is all possible thanks to Mo Fo, coming to fight him in his own personal capacity, rather than as a representative of the Alliance of Tribes. Between that and the fact that he lost the fight, there's no animosity between their groups right now. With everything else taken care of for the moment, Gao Peng remembers Brainy has been staying on Earth. He pulls out a recorder to assign some new tasks, and hands it over to Dumby, so he can deliver it to Brainy when he goes to Earth. As Dumby takes off, Gao Peng calls out to him to avoid joining the war and focus on helping the souls of the deceased transcend. What a deceptively nice way of saying, eat them all up. Back on Earth, what was once the proud city of Yuzhou is now little more than a collection of dusty ruins. This is the scene Dumby arrives at, a single large spatial rift perpetually present in the sky above the city. With the sun and moon both gone, the light that shines on Earth now is what's coming through from the GUT on Shidi. Dumby sadly comments on how Gao Peng must be saddened by the state of this place. After that, he arrives at the river, where Brainy has been spending his time. When Dumby calls the psychic familiar out, a lanky figure emerges from the surface of the water. I've... What the hell is that? No, seriously. What is that? The creature that's just appeared has the body of a human, likely a copy of Gao Peng's, and the head of a worm, I think. This is so weird. Dumby tosses the recorder Gao Peng sent towards Brainy, who catches it with ease. He tells Brainy he should know how to use it, so he'll be off to attend to other matters. Just like that, he's gone. Standing in place, Brainy examines the recorder and wonders if Gao Peng is planning to send him back to the Black Fa world. As it turns out, that's not his intention at all. The recorded message informs Brainy that he still has to stay on Earth a while longer because of his ability, and Gao Peng is sorry about that. More to the point, he believes he's finished capturing the Yangtze River and will be setting his sights on the Pacific Ocean next. What in the, who now? What happened to any and all semblance of sense here? The message goes on to tell Brainy, he doesn't have to do this at once, it's just a task to be completed sometime in the future. Oh, Brainy's the one conquering the water masses. Okay, that makes sense then. These translations get really confusing sometimes. Brainy lies down on the water surface after the message ends, and thanks his lucky stars he gets to stay here on Earth. He's convinced that living with Gao Peng is a miserable existence. That means following his every order. A fish suddenly pokes its head out of the water, while Brainy is thinking and refers to him as Dad. Okay. This whole chapter is just a fever dream at this point. When Brainy asks what's wrong, the fish tells him that a group of monsters is chasing some humans nearby. Seeing this as an opportunity to get on Gao Peng's good side, and to build a reputation for himself as well, Brainy decides to go help these people. With all the monsters in the Yangtze River being his underlings now, he's practically invincible, and he's gotten bored of that. It's time to have some fun. A while later, Brainy arrives at the shore, where the battle between humans and monsters is taking place. Right as the humans are being put on the back foot and losing hope, a massive creature made of water appears at the river bank. It declares its name to be Shun Changshi, the supreme water god of the Shu Anming infinite world, who watches over this river. For attacking humans in his territory, it sentences the monsters to death by drowning. As this is all taking place, Brainy is watching and pulling the strings from a distance, happy to see his plan so far is working. To his surprise, the humans actually seem to have picked up on the water god name he gave himself, and actually believe it. Brainy decides to take advantage of this, and hits them all with a minor mind alteration, to make them believe in this god fully. With his work here done for now, Brainy leaves the area with his underlings, Back on the shore, the humans speak about their savior, the water god. While most of them are grateful to this strange god, one particular guy claims they don't know what its intentions are. 
Before the argument can become a full-blown fight, an older man calms things down and suggests repaying the water god for saving their lives with a sacrifice. At the suggestion of one man about the sacrifices in stories of old, they decide to offer up some livestock. Sure enough, the group of humans arrive at the shore the next day with a whole roasted cow as an offering. Despite their apprehension as to whether the god will even like this, they offer up the cow and wait, and wait, and then wait some more. It's only a full half hour later, when they're beginning to doubt their plan, that a massive water claw shoots out of the water and swipes the cow off the shore. Unknown to Brainy, a ship a good distance away from the shore has a direct view of the show. He's putting on for his newly acquired followers. The captain is just terrified by what he sees, as yet another new danger to worry about and orders his men to hurry so they can get the hell away from here. That's when one of the crew points out to him that the people on the shore seem to be worshipping the strange water titan. Instantly, the captain whips out his phone and starts recording the whole event. Why? I dunno. Back in the Black Fog world, Yao Peng is grilling some meat on the outdoor barbecue. When the news comes in of a certain new deity in the Yangtze River, Gao Peng instantly recognizes this as the work of Brainy and wonders just what the hell he's doing over there. Goldie takes some shots at Brainy for being shameless enough to claim himself as a pre-existing god, but only because he wishes he'd thought it first. Flamey lives up to his name and roasts the crap out of Goldie for his words, followed by a stare down that shows just which of them is the inferior being. I remember when that damn bird wasn't so terrifying. Simpler times. Next to Gao Peng, Fishy comments that Brainy wants to follow the path of belief to become a god. When Gao Peng expresses interest in this new concept, Fishy explains that this is a method of reaching the god tier as well. By maintaining a large group of believers, the being can become a god tier faster than through other methods, but it will be much weaker in terms of combat power. The weakest even. Gao Peng seizes the chance for a jab at Fishy and slightly comments that he thought the weakest god is him. Naturally, this puts off Fishy, who refuses to speak any further. With all the relevant facts in place, Yao Peng decides that the best option is to help Brainy along this path to becoming a god, since that will benefit them too. He opens the floor to his familiars and tells them to speak if they have any ideas on how to go about helping Brainy. Rather than getting suggestions, Gao Peng is then treated with a front row seat to the comedy drama that is Goldie, Treasure Sniffing Mouse, and Flamey's friendship dynamic. It's only towards the end of their back and forth when Gao Peng hears something that freezes his blood cold. Flamey is pregnant with Goldie? Wait, Flamey's a girl? Luckily for Gao Peng's sanity, Flamey confirms that there's zero truth to that idea and blasts Goldie for making it sound like the burn has gotten fat. Seeing the absolute circus in front of him, Gao Peng sighs and wonders why there's nobody reliable here. As if to answer his prayers, a reasonable voice finally appears and tells him that the more sincere the worshipper's belief is, the more faith they can provide to the god. This knowledge comes from Myrna, who has come back to spend some time with the group. As she devours a barbecue skewer and bats away her dad, she tells Gao Peng to send a ton of this stuff to her nest, since it tastes good. Sounds like me. Anytime I go to a buffet. Now, taking everything he's learned into consideration, Gao Peng comes up with the idea of forming an organization, similar to a church to grow Brainy's followers. For that, they'll need to get help from people higher up in the government. A little while later, Gao Peng and Grandpa Ji have a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss this idea. As they discuss the viability of growing the following of Brainy as a god, they conclude that cooperating with the right officials is the best way to go. Grandpa Ji tells Gao Peng that he can leave the matter at him, since he's already cooperating with the Chinese government. With that talk concluded, Gao Peng chokes on some of his grandpa's tea, before telling him that he needs to head out again now. He's finally found a suitable place to train his dragon ants, and wishes to get to it as soon as possible. Grandpa Ji just smiles at him and tells him to go ahead. Even though he has faith in Gao Peng's strength, he tells his grandson to be careful anyway, as any loving grandparent would. At a later time, Gao Peng arrives at a remote mountain range in the Black Fa world, completely frozen over with ice. This right here is the place. Once they've arrived at the mountain range, Gao Peng gets straight to starting the Dragon Ants training, without a moment's pause. He sends Elder Baby forward to challenge, and suppress a snow demon lion up ahead. As the two beasts clash, the younger Dragon Ants cheer on their older brother, amazed by his power and skill. Unfortunately, this just distracts Elder Baby, who's already on the defensive at this point, because of the lion's superior strength. One of the Dragon Ants instantly comes charging his way upon hearing this, completely ignoring 
when his older brother calls out for him to stop. Next thing they know, both Elder Baby and his opponent have been sent blasting off into the air, Team Rocket style, because the younger dragon ant launched them unknowingly. When they finally land in the distance, the lion is injured, and Elder Baby's bloody berserker passive is triggered. In this state, he manages to rip right through the lion with his claws. The lion isn't one to back down either though, and so, in its trapped state, it bites into Elder Baby's shell with enough force to puncture it completely. Back at his original spot, Gao Peng wonders if Elder Baby just isn't strong enough to win, even with his passive skill popped. As such, he orders Second Baby to use his diurnal pupil skill on the lion, while being careful not to hit Elder Baby. Second Baby does just that and blasts the lion, but this only causes it to bite into Elder Baby even harder, hurting a scream out of him. In the following moments, a new fighter makes his way onto the scene. Under the camouflage of light itself, this monster not only gets the lion off of Elder Baby, but also makes quick work of it, with a series of gaining slashes via its blades. The younger dragon ants rush towards Elder Baby, where he's collapsed, and beg him not to die. Something he wasn't going to do anyway, but that's pretty nice. Gao Peng even admits that while the victory wasn't ideal, Elder Baby did finally manage to hunt down a level 75 demon lion of perfect quality. Finally, he examines the seventh baby, a psychic dragon ant named the Heart Ant. As he lists the things that are wrong with the baby, he tearfully apologizes for disappointing him. Say sorry to that baby right the frick now. Despite their flaws though, Gao Peng has to admit, if only to himself, that he's missed this feeling. The feeling of going out to strengthen his familiars as a team. With a nostalgic smile on his face, he tells the dragon ants it's time to go find their next target. Meanwhile, back in Hope City, Grandpa G is having a meeting, with none other than Tong Ling, about some ruins. As the two speak of the possibility of these ruins opening soon, Grandpa G tells her he'll see if he can send Gao Peng to explore them, at her request. Once she thanks him and leaves, G calls Gao Peng on his big screen. After getting a quick status update, he tells Gao Peng that the ruins they recently spoke of will be opening soon, and the tribe will send a team to investigate. As such, he wants to know if Gao Peng would like to go with them. Naturally. Yao Peng tells him that he'll absolutely do so, and the decision is made. After all, according to Fishy, those ruins are where several gods fell, so their artifacts will probably be there for the taking. Bro is always thinking about the grind. Days later, Gao Peng has arrived at the location known as the Pole of Surface. Here, he joins up with several members of different tribes as they gather together under the leadership of Ching Yu Nun, a quasi-god monster trainer from the Green God tribe. Gao Peng is surprised by the presence of such a high-level trainer, but it makes sense considering the value of what's inside these ruins. As it so often does when he's involved though, trouble finds the group, before they can even begin their expedition. A giant spatial rifters open above them, and even Ching Yu Nun himself looks on with terror at what is coming out of it. A giant monstrosity covered in jagged crimson scales makes its way through the rift and into another, completely ignoring the group of humans. Ching Yu Nun warns them to be completely still, and just wait for this creature to leave, as it's a destructive beast. One of the gathered tribesmen fearfully asks what a destructive beast is. To this, Ching Yu Nun explains that they are a special category of large monsters. They live in the cracks of space itself, where there's nothing but a vacuum. Because of the brutal environment in these cracks, hosting all sorts of indescribable natural disasters, the beasts that preside here have adapted to be the toughest living beings in existence. Luckily, that also means they pay no mind to lesser beings, as long as they don't draw their attention. Silver lining right. Once the destructive beast has left, the group breathes a collective sigh of relief, and Qin Yu Nun goes right back, to leading them into the ruins. Set ruins are so breathtaking, even Gao Peng lets out an odd word or two. According to Qing, this was once a floating island, but plummeted to the ground for some unknown reason, at some unknown point in time. The entrance to the mystery land is inside this crash floating island. He turns to the tribesmen he's playing guide for, and advises them not to rely on flying familiars to get onto the floating island. With no surety on how the law of floating functions here, they could be putting themselves in a situation that spells their own doom. With that warning, Ching tells the group that the mystery land doesn't allow the presence of quasi-gods and higher, so he won't accompany them inside. On a plus side, this means anything they find inside is entirely theirs to keep. Well, damn. That's pretty freaking generous. Just like that, the tribesmen race to the cliffside of the fallen island and start climbing. 
Gao Peng stays where he is and notes how strange it is that these people started climbing the ideal paths with zero hesitation, right after getting here. Hearing his name being called, Gao Peng turns to see Tong Ling. After greeting each other, she gets right to the point. She's heard how strong he's gotten, and wants to work together. His assistance in getting her a specific item, in exchange for a map charted by her tribe, which holds crucial details about the ruins. With this, he won't have to waste time exploring the areas with lower-level loot, and can go straight to the big stuff. Gao Peng takes a few moments to consider what she said. From what he understands, if the Tong tribe were strong enough to chart a map of this place, then the others should have similar items too. With that in mind, he turns towards the other tribesmen, and tells Tong Ling that he's in. When she moves to hand him her map, he tells her to wait. He has a plan. Oh, this is not going to be good for everyone else, is it? As it turns out, this plan of his is to demand the maps of every other tribe as well. Naturally, none of them are very happy about his incredibly rude demands, and try to cow him by reminding him. None is just outside. Gao Peng just becomes more amused and tells them to stop calling him a thief, since he'll just take a look and then return their maps. Infuriated, one of the tribesmen calls forth his familiar, and sends it right at Gao Peng. This, unfortunately for him, was not the right move. With a single word from Gao Peng, Da Zi shows himself and electrocutes the enemy familiar so badly that it goes completely unconscious. Seeing what has happened, the other tribesmen close in and band together against Gao Peng. Because why wouldn't that work? Not like he just nagged one of your guys as easily as breathing. The next familiar called out to fight Gao Peng is a level 83 Yak King with a grade too low for Gao Peng to care. Next is a level 84 bird familiar named Da Feng. This one's slightly more of a threat, but Gao Peng remains more amused than anything. Shrugging his shoulders, he asks the others if there are any more familiars they'd like to send, so they don't regret it later. The tribesmen are infuriated by what they see as arrogance, and Da Feng is ordered to attack. In just a few moments, the entire area around Gao Peng and Da Zi has become pitch black, trapping them in a dome of darkness. Gao Peng remains calm and unites with Da Zi, just to be safe, before making his next move. From inside Da Zi, he studies this dark technique, and learns that it functions by erasing light altogether. Da Feng attacks Da Zi's body in the dark, leaving him defenseless without any way to sense him. As the other side monologues about how he should surrender, Gao Peng considers calling Dumbi, and having him overpower this technique with his soul power alone. Instead, he decides to try out a new move he's been itching to use for a while now. He calls out Second Baby and activates the skill, known as Sense Sharing. With this, the diurnal pupils are shared from the Dragon Ant to Gao Peng, and then in turn to Da Zi. Now that he's fully capable of seeing this place, Yao Peng tells Da Zi to pretend like nothing's changed. And so, he continues flailing about seemingly blindly, just barely dodging when Da Feng attacks, so it seems like instinct. Then, when Da Feng is just in reach with his guard down, Da Zi activates Silver Thunder Wrath. The storm of lightning rages across the dark backdrop, reaching Da Feng too fast for the bird to dodge. Just like that, the thunder from Da Zi's attack fries the bird like a bucket of KFC, and brings down the Dome of Darkness. Once they're out, Yao Peng has Da Zi fly a bit higher than the rest, so he can observe the other familiars. The Yak appears to be releasing some kind of fumes. From what Gao Peng knows, this is the ultimate musk, a drug that mutates and becomes highly toxic, when the concentration exceeds a certain amount. That combined with the main attacking eight-tailed thunder beast, spells do for these fools, and they don't even realize what they're walking into. And so, Gao Peng does the smart thing, and takes advantage of his enemy's idiocy. With a single burst of lightning, from Da Zi all over the area, the yak is fried to a crisp. With some of their strongest familiars taken down like flies, the tribesmen have no choice but to comply when Gao Peng once more asks to take a look at their maps. One by one, each of them hands over their maps, as requested by Gao Peng, so he can cross-reference the differences in them all. Even so, none of them are happy about having to listen to him. Gao Peng just takes the maps with a smile, and assures them he'll give them back right away, as he pulls a sleek black rectangle from his pocket. Then, as the tribesmen watch on in confusion, and barely concealed anger, Gao Peng snaps a bunch of photos of the maps with his smartphone, an act none of them can even begin to understand. Three cheers for modern technology, you backwater stuck-up douchebags. The end, for now.